Welcome back to Bumblebee Loyal Viewer. For today's video on the top 10 ridiculous rules women in the Victorian era had to obey. Rule number 10 is going to be follow the moral encyclopedia. For ornery young men and women desperately desiring physical and emotional intimacy, yet having to navigate a dating culture that required them to act a certain way, well, it meant self-help books were all the rage. And women in particular drowned in them, thanks to the fact that these books were often written by hypocritical men and had been used since for medieval time to dictate and instruct women on how to become the perfect submissive little doll. Some examples are Henry Butter's ominously titled Maiden, Prepare to Become a Happy Wife and Mother from 1868, and Hayden Brown's Advice to Single Women from 1899. Perhaps most famously though on advising the morals of young women was the Moral Encyclopedia by Charles Varl, which had been making young women hate themselves since 1861. It was a bestseller of its day thanks to the marketing that only decent and morally driven and women would own it. To prove themselves as that woman, Victorian gals flock to the bookstores to absorb some menial patriarchal crap that goes as follows. Read no novels, but let your study be history, geography, biography, and other instructive books. Also, trust no female acquaintance, i.e. make no confidant of anyone, because we don't want you ganging up together. Um, I mean, possibly breaking your feeble tongues, having a conversation. Oh, and if you get a pimple, expect nobody to ever love you again. To quote, remember that whereas the character of a young lady is considered angelic, and blemish in it would withdraw the respect men have for you. Rule number nine is to follow a handbook of etiquette for ladies. Following on a similar sales tactic of gaslighting, only perfect and honorable women know all the rules of etiquette. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's such a shame. Now you lose all your honor. You know, though, I can help you out. It's pretty convenient that right here behind me, I have this book I wrote and it has all the rules. I mean, I can give it to you so you can restore your honor. If you give me like $30, I don't know. So what's in this immensely popular best seller from the 1860s that bullies women. Well, I'm so glad you asked. First up, keep that bling to a minimal mamas as you should never wear mosaic gold or paste diamonds. They are representative of a mean ambition to appear what you are not and most likely what you ought not to wish to be. You got a problem with that? Well, sucks. Pipe down because it's better to say too little than too much in company. Let your conversation be consistent with your gender and age. Don't forget to never talk about yourself either as such discussions cannot be interesting to others and the probability is that the most patient listener is laying the foundation for some tale to make you appear ridiculous. If you do open your mouth and your choice is to be a dirty joke, girl BFF because a double entendre is detestable in a woman, especially when perpetrated in the presence of men. No man of taste can respect any woman who's guilty of it. Oh, my personal favorite. Did you break something while a guest in someone else's house? Nah. As a lady, you can't do that. It's not possible. Pretend like nothing ever happened. Don't own up to it and gaslight your host. About another's house, should you break anything, do not appear to notice it. Your hostess, if a lady, would take no notice of the calamity, nor say, as is sometimes done by ill-bred persons, oh, it is of no consequence. Rule number eight is having a dress for all occasions. Should you not, well, that's not proper etiquette. As a middle or upper middle class Victorian woman, your job was to spend your day like a brat stall, changing every few hours. This is because of the strict etiquette etiquette of the time, which dictated that certain dresses were for certain activities, which meant you had to plan your errands around your outfit changes that made it possible for you to run your errands. Isn't that fun? Women would start with the morning time dress, which was relatively comfortable by Victorian standards. However, for us, it would still feel like wearing an iron reinforced tube sock on our entire body. It was simpler in appearance and designed for only the home. Want to take a stroll in the park? Out of the morning dress and into the walking dress. The skirts are shorter by several inches and didn't have a train, so they weren't dragging a leaf pile behind them as they went. The materials were usually rich in color and pattern to be admired amongst the greenery. When women returned home from their daily walk, they would change in dress number three, or the afternoon dress for receiving visitors or visiting others. The skirts had a longer train and the neckline was usually a little lower. After some visiting time, dress number four gets whipped out for dinner and it was the most formal of all casual dresses, usually silk, satins, velvets, exactly the type of precious material you want to spill food on. Ball gowns weren't for regular wear, but they were required for fancy occasions so you had to own them too. Rule number seven is to mourn properly. Another dress all women owned was an all black morning dress. They kept 
kept these bad boys unlocked for whenever someone died, which was arguably something to look forward to in the Victorian era. Thanks to Victoria being the most extraordinary and dramatic woman of all time when her husband, Prince Albert, died in 1861, and she spent a bajillion years dressing like a vampire and wearing black mantillas, it set this bizarre fashion and mourning standard that metamorphosized into literal rules. If one was to ignore these rules, it was seen as incredibly offensive to the deceased. Self-help books dedicated to making men and women better at exerting dramatic woe were pretty common to see on bookstore shelves. So a mourning rule for women was should her husband die, the widow was expected to mourn for no less than two years, while mourning for parents and offspring only lasted a year. Relatives such as grandparents and siblings would only get six months. They dole it out like family inheritance is a little weird. Queen Victoria had favored black crepe, and it became one of the only fabrics that was permissible for mourning clothing. Luxurious silks and satins weren't permissible, only itchy and abrasive materials that chafed the sadness right into you. Women would often wear merino or cashmere instead. No jewelry or ornamentation was permitted unless it served a functional purpose like a button or a clasp, or unless it was a bunch of the deceased's hair and teeth braided in a pattern together in the jewelry. Don't forget your big black hat and grandma's doily tablecloth you dyed black to throw over your face and body. Joy looking like a corpse for two years. Rule number six is to glove up. We love to joke about the whole, oh no, if you show your ankle, you're a Victorian W word. But weirdly, hands were actually way more of an issue. The ankle thing was just because men were still trying to look up women's skirts, even when they were so long, the ends of them entered a room 15 minutes after the wearer did. Fingers were actually oh, the gasp worthy thing of the day. It was considered highly inappropriate to walk in public spaces with uncovered hands and would draw a lot of ill repute to those daring damsels who did. In fact, women's hands were so scandalous, both written and unwritten rules of Victorian etiquette unanimously agreed that if a man and a woman happened to be walking on an unevenly surfaced road, it was the one and only time that he could take her hand if they were unwed. Funny that the only permissible contact between the couple the yet to be engaged is to prevent her needing to be picked up from a Victorian pile of mud sludge. It does not matter where you are headed outside of your home, you must wear gloves, which weren't just a popular fashion accessory, but as stated, social necessity. Like every other item a woman could wear in this era, there were many kinds of gloves based on the occasion. For example, daytime was for short gloves, which usually bore designs, embellishments, whereas in the evening, gloves had feathers, satin ribbons, and other super flammable decorations. Rule number five is the modest dip. Because we're on the topic of acceptable fashions and modesty, a Victorian woman taking a dip at the beach pretty much looked the same as four burly men sitting in an ice fishing hut in Alaska. First of all, this was something only middle and upper middle class people could really do as it required money. You had to rent bathing machines, which looked like outhouses on wheels, but were really covered carriages that drove through the shallow water of the beach. There was a hole in the bottom that the ladies could stick their legs into or sometimes submerge their whole body, but that was ill-advised, not because the water was filthy, which it was, and riddled with corpses and poison to boot, but because creeps could come swimming up and see your bare legs. Can't afford the traveling outhouse? Well, no beach for you. Rule number four is wife sales, a real legal way to obtain a divorce in stuffy Christianized England. Divorce was unpopular, detested, and openly deterred in those days. Seeing as you were discouraged from intercourse with your partner, married them when you barely knew them, and could barely spend time alone with one another, it was a pretty popular request. You would have to sit listening to the clock tick and his nose being clogged, but him not blowing it for the 444th night in a row while you disassociate staring into a fireplace. What the hell did people expect, of course you want out. You don't even know his middle name. Attaining a divorce in the early 1900s was an expensive undertaking, however. So those who couldn't afford the legal fees sometimes sold their wives to the highest bidder. It was often done with the full consent of the wife, who was usually bought by her family, a new lover, or a female friend. It was an amicable way to say, this was a mistake, get out of my house, good luck and prosper. Rule number three is no flirting. As stated, you were really not supposed to flirt, and flirting to the Victorians included eye contact, talking to one another, looking at another person, breathing their air, knowing their name. Maybe the last one is dramatic, but you get my point. You wanted someone, you had to wait until you met them four or five times, then you could look at them, run into them a couple more times, then maybe request a dance at a ball, and you get one of those a couple times, then maybe you get a sit down chaperone visit, maybe a walk in the park, and a couple more ball dances, then you can propose. But even then, a Victorian maiden could not be trusted alone with her fiance, lest her dainty, fluttering hand rest on the arm of her entire 
intended and cause an outburst that would inflame the fiance's uncontrollable base lusts. Even after progressing through several stages of acceptable dating, aka the ball dancing, talking, walking together at a distance, if a man was invited to the woman's home, their acquaintanceship would still have to be under the watchful eye of a chaperone. Single women were never to indulge in behavior with a man that might lead to being kissed or handled in any way. This included strict inspection rules, because I kid you not, men were encouraged to inspect a woman back then. Like many of the stipulations that accompany shipping procedures, how romantic. If a man wanted to admire a necklace, the woman would have to remove it, hand it over for inspection. Under no circumstances was the item to be inspected while she wore it. Now I know where that flirting tactic came from because guys, y'all love that whole jewelry admiring flirt and it isn't subtle. And of course, during the chance encounters in one's club or in the park, staring boldly at someone you knew without acknowledging him or her, known as cutting, was the ultimate display of bad flirting manners in Victorian times. Guess they didn't like them bold back then. Rule number two is coming out. Not like that. Coming out in Victorian times meant a woman was tired of being in her parents' house, and if she wanted out of it, it meant she had to go find a semi-tolerable guy whose house she could move into in return for a cool ring on her left hand. This had to be a whole big announcement because to attend such events that a woman needed to to meet a potential suitor, she required the explicit permission of her mother. Only after stating her intent could the chaperones be organized because she can't go alone. Think of Bridgerton. Rich families might accompany the announcement with a series of parties or even a royal visit. Middle class families might hold a celebratory feast. Lower class families might not formally celebrate the announcement at all. Instead, the young woman just changed her appearance to show availability. This could be putting up her hair, donning a long dress, and accompanying family members to social events like church service, church dinners, festival balls. Coming out was best done during the in season, a literal term. It meant the four months from April to July where the upper class families up and down the country would send their teenage daughters to London. After flocking there en masse, the upper classes would congregate a series of balls and dances for the purpose of meeting, matching, and reproducing the next generations. At these events, the race was on to find someone with whom to make love. Again, this phrase of which, whose meaning has changed considerably over time. Making love in the Victorian age meant seeking out someone who might one day come to love you. This was done by eligible bachelors going up to girls' chaperones, giving them a little card, requesting a dance with her. Her dance cards would be stacked in queue order in which the men got their dances, and they were only allowed three per woman. End of the night rolls around, and our maid will choose if she liked a suitor and have her chaperone return the card to indicate, oh yeah buddy, it's on. Rule number one is how to travel, aka how not to have fun. Here's your duties when you're traveling as a Victorian lady. Listen up, take notes, dress appropriately. This is usually a dress similar to the morning gown, lighter and easier to move around in, but most importantly, plain and understated with few details. They would accessorize with dark leather gloves, straw bonnet, and of course, a travel corset, which was apparently said to be much less restrictive. Pick your seat carefully, it was customary for a woman Women traveling alone choose a seat either next to another woman or an elderly gentleman. Women traveling alone were seen as prime targets for pitpocketers and thieves. It was usually only done to poor women without chaperone options, but all women, rich or poor, were instructed to keep only a small amount of customary spending cash on their person and give the bulk of their dough to their driver or escort to keep safe. Speak when spoken to, as only men were allowed to spark conversation with a lady, never the opposite way around. Women were expected to respond politely and accept invitations to the refreshment saloon, even if they didn't want to go. That's because the next rule. Never ever be rude while traveling, especially alone. It was imperative a woman act with the utmost class, even if being accosted by a persistent male passenger. But make sure you don't pester him. If a woman is traveling with a male companion, it's not appropriate to ask him such questions as, when do we get there? How far is it? You know you're making the wrong turn. Yes, you are. I know you are. I've been this way before. Look, that was the wrong way. How much time do you think that wrong turn added? Do you want to stop and grab something too? Yeah, no, strictly forbidden. Can't do that crap. But don't forget, you're also a babysitter to the because if the lady's male chaperone accidentally wandered into designated female compartments, it was her fault for either inviting him into the quarters or not alerting him of the specialized area. And lastly, while traveling, don't check yourself in. If a journey requires a stop at a hotel along the way, the lady would remain in the carriage while the driver or escort took care of all the room arrangements, likely because it was unheard of for a woman to make such a decision on her own. Thank you once again for tuning in to Bumblebee. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to take some time to subscribe to The Hive, drop a like, and leave some comments. I'll see you around.